Um, actually, I, I was on a farm where we raised about two acres of raspberries. And they were, uh, I loved raspberries because they were, you didn't have to bend down so far to pick them. It was just like these little precious red rubies and they were so delicious. And uh, the story I remember about uh, raspberries is that how they were so easy to sell. And so like, I remember one morning, Saturday morning, uh, we picked raspberries and I drove like 200 pints of raspberries down to the Minneapolis farmer's market. And I gave them to my brother, Joe, he's 15 years old. It's okay, Joe, here they are. I got to go park the truck and I'll be back in a minute to help you sell them. So I came back and literally 10 minutes later, I was there, I, I was gone 10 minutes. I come back and Joe doesn't have any raspberries left. And he was just like, I said, Joe, what happened? And he goes, they found me and a swarm came and it all sold out. Sorry. Should have been charging more. That, I mean, no, that's exactly what I told Joe. I said, Joe, why don't you change the price? Make it more expensive. He said, there was no time to change the price. There was a huge group right there swarming them. So that poor guy. Um, but that just tells you how unbelievably delicious raspberries are and uh and they are a cold hearty fruit but and i'm so glad we're talking about that this year because the fate of raspberries in north dakota you know could be is really at risk with this spotted wing drosophila you mentioned earlier tonight with the june berries and so let's talk about raspberry tonight and we're very fortunate to have our high value crop specialist from north dakota state university Harleen Hederman Valenti is here to share with us some tips on how to be successful growing raspberries. So Harleen, okay. welcome to the forums. Well, thank you, Tom, You're and welcome. thanks for the invitation. Oh, sure. Um, yeah, on the, my way over here, I almost died. Um, oh, my. I'm hurrying because I thought I was supposed to be here and ready to talk at 7.50, and I saw it was like 7.42, and I was like, oh, my gosh. So I'm I'm scurrying on the, on the sidewalk, and this gray squirrel was in the trash can, jumped out of the trash can as I'm just walking by. I just went, ah, screamed, and, and everyone's looking at me. I said, it was a squirrel. Yeah, yeah but everyone just kind of kept walking like crazy woman on the sidewalk. But anyway, so, so I'm much calmer now than I was about uh, five minutes ago. So we're going to get started with this. Um, I also, I didn't grow up with as much raspberry experiences as you have, but perhaps Tom, you should be talking here. No. And, uh, no. but uh, um, both my grandmothers and we had, well, we had more strawberries than raspberries, but both my grandmothers had um, raspberries, so, and red raspberries. And I grew up in Northeast Nebraska. And mm. so, um, and what, what Tom said is true is um, there are a lot of cultivars of red raspberries that are hardy enough for our, our growing here in North Dakota. Not so much when you're talking about purple and black. So um, just a little bit, you know, so there's purple, there's black raspberries, and then they cross the black ones with the red ones and they got purple ones. Black raspberries are a lot less hardy. And so um, so the purples are kind of in between, and um, I know uh, here we have been growing amethyst for a while, and that seems to do pretty well unless the rabbits decide to go and, and girdle all your canes um, on campus, but otherwise not so bad. So um, I kind of talked about the three types, uh, and uh, there's also the yellow, which you'd say, wait, that should be four types, but you know the the yellows are actually reds without that red pigment, so they're grouped with the reds. Um, and and then there's two fruiting types, and so you might have heard primal cane um, fruit bearing and floral cane fruit bearing. And as you can see, um, the floral cane fruiting ones are the ones that are typical um, that way back when that I grew up with, in which um, these stems come up as primal canes, they're vegetative, they go and then set um, their fruiting buds in the fall, and the following year, those canes then fruit, um, uh, flower, fruit, and then they die. 
And so the whole thing with raspberries is, you know, after those uh, floor canes are done fruiting, you cut those out um, and then you keep the other ones. The whole thing about the res red raspberries, and I'll probably get to that, versus the purple and black is also kind of intriguing. But anyway, so now our primal cane fruiting uh, raspberries, they actually fruit at the tips of those first year canes. And so um, they'll, you, what generally people do is they'll cut them to the ground in the fall or maybe um, early spring and new ones will come up and on the ends they'll bear fruit, flower and fruit late, uh, later in the fall. Now you could go and actually um, keep the, that lower portion and they could go and bear some fruit as in a floricane fruiting one. Um, but uh, not a lot of times uh, it takes a lot more kind of work to do that. So, and so the floricane fruiting ones are generally called those summer bearing and they'll bear more in the summer months. And then your, your primal cane ones bear uh, fall bearing, or they also call them ever bearing because you could keep them over and get them in the summer and fall. So here's a picture, as you can see. Um, if I was to ask you which ones are the floral cane fruiting ones here during the season, you would say it's the ones that have that woody stem. And the ones with the green stems are the uh, the primal canes. And so they won't fruit until next year. Okay, where is the best place to go and plant these raspberries? I think it's really important. And the most important thing is full sun. I remember riding bike by this one area and um, they had a nice, oh, I'd say it was a 10 by foot by 10 foot square. And they had probably 20 raspberry plants in there. And for probably eight good years, I never saw a single raspberry on those. In fact, they never got more than about like this. They were under this deep shade. And, you know, I don't know why the homeowner thought, hey, let's go and plant this under this you know, big maple and, and elm tree and think that they could actually get some raspberries. But after eight years, they gave up and they, uh, they seeded it to grass. So, um, But you also would like to have a well-drained soil. They don't really like to have... Um, I guess waterlogged feet, and so um, so it's very important that you have well-drained soils. Now you will need to supplement, as you can see there, about an inch, inch and a half per week um, from flowering to harvest because you know they are taking up. I, I mean that really determines how big. You know, genetically the raspberry is. You know, it, um, the size of the the fruit is determined genetically but it can be altered by lack of water and so just like any fruit if you do not give it enough water you're going to have smaller uh, smaller fruits so you want to make sure you really give it enough water during that flowering to harvest time um, you also see uh, I tried to put that down on a more um, small basis on how much fertilizer and that's just basically we're looking at the nitrogen that we would be applying um, to those plants. Most of our soils have uh, ample amounts of uh, phosphorus and potassium. Uh, I know we're removing some when we harvest, but um, you know, uh, there really isn't much of a need. And there's a lot of recycling and mineralization occurring. So. Um, it's really the nitrogen that can go and leach out and that we need in a much higher amount. And so with um, our full sunlight, we would have um, a better chance of getting some air circulation, but you also want to go and make sure that you don't have this all packed in so that uh, the leaves stay wet for a long period of time. There are a lot of diseases that raspberries could succumb to um, and so good air circulation is going to be really good. Now that doesn't mean you want to have a jet turbine 
blowing through there because they also, as you can see, are sensitive to desiccation. So if you're in a high wind area, then maybe you have to provide some protection so that you don't have that 40 mile an hour wind just blowing them around. Um, spacing, as you can see, uh, reds were putting two to three foot apart. Um, our blacks and purple, that's what the BL and PUR mean, that's four foot apart. And you might say, well, wait up, why are we doing that? Why can't we put them all the same? And this is where I get to talk to you about how um, the blacks and purples differ from the reds. The blacks and purples really set more of a crown system, and so they kind of stay in their place. The reds, hmm. They have a very, uh, have more of a creeping root system, and so they like to spread out and they like to fill in. That's kind of good, especially in the in uh, the northern areas. Um, and so, but that also makes managing them a little bit more difficult. And so, um, you can do a lot of things for trellising. A lot of uh, commercial operations will use a T or a B trellis. Something just to keep those canes upright um, and uh, not snagging clothes as, quick, as much as possible. You know, uh, there are some of them that don't have, well, as many thorns as others. And definitely raspberries are a lot kinder than blackberries, which like to just grab you and actually almost um, bleed you to death. But so. Um, but you you don't necessarily need that T and B trellis. You can come up with anything really if you wanted to. Um, they are self fertile, so um, it isn't mandatory that you have to have bees there to pollinate. But bees will help with the pollination. And uh, um, actually, I think it's really kind of cool to have you know that that the raspberries are there helping the bees as well. With the, with the pollination. We will need to prune annually with those fluorocane ones. You gotta take out those fluorocanes after they're, they're done with the primal canes. You can take everything out. That makes it a lot easier. Um, and so a lot of times when you have these commercial operations, they'll just go and mow everything off with the primal canes instead of picking and choosing, oh, this one and that one. Um, uh, rabbits love to nibble cane bark, and I mentioned that already. Um, we, uh, one year, well, on campus here, we seem to be growing a wonderful herd, gackle, I don't know, um, but a lot of rabbits. And, um, and they made this um, water reservoir um, where I had some grapes at one time, and those things just love to go down there, and then they come out and they're like, oh, great, we got protection in this little um, hole, and then we can come out later on and we can just eat all the raspberry canes we want. So um, you have to be careful of something like that. Okay, um, so I'm not going to go through all of this. I think everyone has this for yes, a handout. So, and we were talking about how we wanted to stay on time and that there's a big basketball game that right. some people may mm -hmm. want to watch. And so, but I put this picture, um, you know, recently there's been this, you know, kind of like a, a surge in the, the thornless raspberries that you can have on your patio. And so here's an example where you could go and actually be, be growing that it's in a container. And so um, there's a couple companies more in the Northwest, Pacific Northwest, that are really kind of pushing this kind of thing. And so I think everyone would like to be able to go and have their own little raspberry um, container and maybe don't have that kind of space to go in and, and plant that in their backyard. So here's an alternative if, if you want to try something like that. Um, you can see all this other stuff, so I'm going to go and uh, pass over that. And um, <clears throat> so that one was for the, the flora cane fruiting ones. And then these are some of the things for the, your um, primal cane fruiting ones. And so you can see the list is much shorter, a lot less management, I think, or you can do it quicker 
because of the fact that, uh, um, you know, they you just go and mow them off or you prune them all down in, in the fall or in the spring and, and start all over again. And, um, um, well, we don't have a lot of Japanese beetles yet, but, you know, Hopefully, we will never have a lot of Japanese beetle problems, but, you know, that is one of those insects that we have to be watching for. And you can see where the, and, and this is something that I think one has to consider. You see the harvest time, that August through September, and knowing some of the growers that have primal cane fruiting, um, you know, more of a commercial situation. This really has been one of the downfalls of, of the primal cane fruiting one um, cultivars for North Dakota is, okay, so August, September, well, we know how cool our Septembers can start to get. And so with that cool weather, you're not getting the kind of ra uh, rapid ripening that you will when with the fluorocane ones that you get earlier. So things slow down, and then all of a sudden we have a, a freeze and then we're that's it and so um i've seen where they've done some of the season extension with um high tunnels uh with raspberries fall bearing raspberries and have been able to really go and and get a lot more of a yield than they could um, and you might be able to get that accomplished in your little in a area in your backyard where you might have this microclimate, but that's something that you have to uh, be careful about. Okay, so here's some of the, the pruning with our reds. You can see on, well, it, would it be on their, your left, you're looking at it too. <laughs> I'm overanalyzing this whole thing. <laughs> and so, and you can see how that fills in. On the one on the left and then how you would prune to those six to eight um, floricanes per foot so you get that air circulation you get that sunlight and like that on the other hand um, your your uh, more of your crown ones your black and your purples you can see how on the left hand on the right illustration the left hand plant where you have uh, the um, floor canes and then you're going and you're um, pruning those back to about five to nine per plant because they more stay in a plant not so much that you get this hedgerow that you do with your your red raspberries and so this is all floor canes so and so these are the second year what you would do now as far and, and uh, you know that's why this was sent to everyone is because there's so much information and I could have maybe narrowed it, but you know, um, I think selection is good and um, to try some things and, and see what works in your situation. But this came from the University of Minnesota and uh, uh, were their recommendations, but you know, so they have some descriptions and some comments and you can see the zones, the hardiness zones. And so um, most of North Dakota is in probably more three than four. Yeah, uh, no, 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 North Dakota is mostly four. Four now? Yes. In the Global past. Global warming. <laughs> yeah, global warming, okay. Or they just decided to kind of reschedule things. Um, but so you can see, um, if you think you might be in that uh, low pocket where you might go and have more problems or something like that, you could go with a, a zone three. But uh, um, you you see the large selection that you have for the reds. I also put up their Norse Farms. I think they have a great selection of uh, raspberry and other plants, but they uh, I think are a very reputable. Uh, source um, for for plants. Now, when we look at uh, yellow raspberries, there aren't uh, near as many. But on that one, uh, oh, and and perhaps I did it on the yes. So anytime you see that um, asterisk, um, like on Lath Latham and Autumn Britain, um, those came as recommendations by Tom, and so. Is that right? Uh, yes. <laughs> and, and so, um, and um, 
Polana. So, and you can see the difference between the fluorocane and the primal cane ones in there. So, now with the yellow, Anne is the one that has been recommended um, prim primarily and, and really has wonderful taste. Uh, we have it out at the Absaraka um, farm, and, and uh, it, I think it's very tasty. Nice size berries and, and everything. Um, when we go then to our purples, um, yeah, see, things kind of slim down really quickly. Uh, there's probably a few more, like I said, amethysts, but the problem with amethysts is um, I got those from Jack Carter, and um, they actually, that was an introduction by oh, um, an Iowa State professor. I'm thinking of, not Nelson. Mm. Oh back in the 1960s and so um so finding something like amethyst is very difficult um the only reason i have amethyst here on campus is um because of dr carter having that and, and wanting me to go and propagate it because he liked it um but royalty and then when we go to um, um blacks um, really, those are, are the only two that most everything else is uh, zone five. So you can see how um, if you want to grow raspberries, you, you got a lot more selection if you go with the reds. But then comes this little thing, spotted uh, wing drosophila, or SWD, as a lot of people like to say because they don't like to have that mouthful, um, much easier to go and roll SWD off of your tongue. And that arrow shows the little larvae that are in uh, raspberries. And the thing that um, SWD differs from other uh, fruit flies, I'm sure you heard, is that they can actually um, put their eggs into fruit. Um, and uh, Unlike other fruit flies that like rotting fruit, these guys attack and gal, well, gal, oh, well, let's not go into the sex of SWD. <laughs> Out of my range there. Um, but anyway, so what happens is when you pick that fruit, if you see some red on the receptacle, you probably have SWD and that the, they're starting to, the eggs have hatched and they're starting to break down the um, the food and to feed them and then the larvae will um, grow pupate and come out as a little uh, fruit fly so um, it's a real prompt um, we had uh, Dr. Kathy Demchek from Penn State uh, last week or weekend before talking about uh, uh, small fruits for high tunnels and we said so what do you have to you know she said in high tunnels, you can, you can actually use some exclusionary netting to kind of keep them out. But she said, we just tell them, you know, two things. Um, you have to go and really pick things clean all the time. Do not let anything get overripe and drop to the ground because you're asking for more problems. So um, pick things clean thoroughly on your picking rotations. Um, and if you have anything that um, has fallen down, make sure you pick it up and get it out of there. Um, and also refrigerate your fruit ASAP immediately um, because that will slow down that whole thing of the eggs hatching and the larvae growing. And then don't look at the fruit, just pop it in your mouth, okay? So, um, but we are looking at a lot of uh, strategies. We're trying to understand more of the SWD. Are there certain fruits that it um, tends to migrate towards? Um, now, I don't have anything scientific with this, but I had uh, a couple uh, raspberry growers, not commercial growers, uh, which had red, black, and purple, and they said they really like the reds. Um, also knowing that the first fruit that we found SWD was red cherries, um, their sour cherries, kind of indicates that they might have a preference for red over other colors. But um, 
Kathy probably said they did go into June berries. And June yes. berries, um, I doubt if they, uh, you know, well, we don't know. Maybe it was when they were red <laughs> instead of when they turned purple, but they found them anyway. So it, it's really, um, I guess, a pest that we have to learn to live with and we have to learn, uh, figure out ways to, you know, more culturally what to do because i'm not a big proponent of spraying a lot of insecticides i'm as low-key and as sustainable as possible and would go without that and, and probably just say close your eyes and pop it in your mouth and actually frozen fruit then make them into you know uh, blend them up you'll never know a little extra protein not that you're going to be bodybuilding with that but you know it's all good so, okay, here's some traps. It's a vinegar trap that they use um, and an indication of whether or not um, what you have there. So um, a good way of monitoring. Uh, and we did actually, uh, Caitlin Kruger went and made some of these at the high tunnel workshop and was giving these out to people. Um, and so with that, Okay, so I was close. Hey, Went a little bit. No, we're doing just fine. We have some questions for you. How about uh, picnic beetles? Uh, do you have any recipes for how do we deal with a picnic beetle? You know, I I think the same thing. Those picnic beetles. Anytime you leave overripe fruit, you're asking for trouble. And once they come in. Then, then you're really, it's difficult. And so, but uh, again, I, they're more attracted, I think, by scents. And so that really ripe fruit attracts them. And uh, yeah. Isn't that the, the, the special thing about spotted wing drosophila is that they will even go after the underripe fruit, whereas mm -hmm. the picnic beetles really target overripe fruit. So picnic beetles are usually much easier to manage Mm -hmm. But that SWD is definitely a yeah. But problem. See, yeah, but they might target the underripe fruit. But if you go and make sure that you pick, right. uh, thoroughly pick anything that's ripe and make sure you remove everything that is ripe, um, they showed how you could really reduce those numbers substantially. For the, for the SWD. With the SWD. <clears throat> and definitely for pregnant beetles, beetles, which we had a couple questions on. Yeah. So just, yeah, that's good. Um, and I'll, let me also throw out that we got a nice publication about integrated pest management of spotted wing drosophila. It has all the details on the pest and chemical, uh, both uh, organic options and synthetic chemical options for you. Um, let's see what else we got here. Do you know, like you mentioned those container raspberries, do you know where you could get those? Would, like you mentioned Norse before, would that be a source for them? I thought it was something like uh, something Creek out of out of Oregon, but um, I would think you if you Norse might. I I just remember when we I took the I went with oh. the Hort Club and we went to several um, uh, nurseries in, in around the Portland area, and the one was talking about how they're working on the containerized actually raspberries and blackberries. Okay. Let's see here. Uh, you mentioned how the SWDs might like the reds. What do you think about yellow? Do the SWDs fly away from yellow raspberries? It says here. Huh? Did warning, some, warning. I was going to say, I, I, you know. We don't know. I don't know. So I. How about. Uh, the SWD is a matter of concern. Any information about how do how do our winters affect the past? Can they survive the extreme cold of North Dakota? Yes. It seems <laughs> like well, they keep coming back. Yeah. That is it, one sad so, thing, you know, about it, them that they have come here and they have established themselves. Yeah. And you know, okay, so um, maybe they're not surviving right there where that cherry tree is but you know if there's a bunch of leaves and they're underneath those leaves and we get all that snow um yeah. you know 
or by buildings that are staying warm and, and not that minus 20 that we're getting. So unfortunately, um, you know, there's plenty of nooks and crannies. Yeah. I mean, I even see ladybugs surviving all winter. That's so right. Um, That's right. How about, are you aware of anybody using netting to control against Spotted winged drosophila has to be a very fine mesh. Huh? Yes, it's very fine mesh. And the only ones that I know that are doing this are more the commercial um, operations where, you know, uh, perhaps they're trying to be completely organic and they, you know, it is kind of pricey. Um, and, and so, and if you have a high tunnel, then you don't need near as much mm, uh, to right. put over. Um, but even with the high tunnels in there, looking at okay, you gotta have a area where you walk in, and then make sure that they're not you don't carry one on you, and you know. So there's a whole bunch of wow. protection that needs to be done there as well. And so, uh, do you know when's the best time to spray the fruit, and when's the best time to put out insect traps? Okay, so your insect traps would have to be. Um, there before your fruit starts to ripen. Um, and then uh, you have to really, with any kind of insecticide, make sure you look at the, read that label thoroughly because they all have a uh, pre-harvest interval. And so, um, and you have to abide by that because they've done all this testing to find out, you know, when those residues are within that tolerance level that um, they've been registered for. So if like Malathion has a three day um, uh, harvest restriction, uh, then that means you have to wait three days before you can harvest those. So read the label carefully. It's a big decision maker for you. Carlene, have you ever heard of the variety called Souris? S O U R I S. I've never heard of that one. Uh, it's a is Souris. Never heard of it, Oliver County. So you might have to Google uh, that, or maybe you're sounds mistaking like, that. Like something from Canada. <laughs> maybe. Uh, never heard of it. It's not a popular variety, at least. Uh, the pupa stage of SWD. What does that look like? Well, Get that uh, publication. It's small. It's small, that's for sure. Yeah. Um, oh. oh, the other thing I wanted to yes. also mention, you know, I, I mentioned malathion. It's really important that um, they really stress if you're going to make any kind of chemical applications to try to control SWD, you have to rotate your, your modes of action. And you don't want to um, go and have uh, resistance to a certain insecticide. So rotation is important. Don't use the same one all the time. Okay, well, uh, there's more information about that particular variety, Souris. It's named after the Souris River near Minot, mm -hmm. purchased from Plant Perfect. Okay, well, very, don't know anything about it, but be better Google it to find out if it's primocaine or if it's a I would think it's a fluorocaine, but. Who knows? Uh, this person has an older patch, over seven years old, it's dying back. What can we do to reinvigorate it? I would practice all those steps that mm -hmm. I had on there and things to do. And yeah. uh, wonder if they're pruning if, regularly. I wonder if they're letting too many and, and not thinning it out. Yeah. And so, um, I think there's been a number of studies in which they kind of, you know, th that recommendation is because, you know, you could let more, but you're not going to get any more fruit. It's just going to be they're smaller. So they've kind of figured out the optimum um, plant population to get the best size fruit because, I mean, yeah, you can get 30 or you can get 10 and that the, they'd be the same weight, and, but I'd rather eat the 10 than those 30 little ones. Yeah, so. That's right. And uh, the other thing is that when people say their their planting's dying back, I often get, it's really the, would you like to talk about, talk about that? Yeah. Um, I haven't done any kind of research on the viruses, but I know, you know, most of the commercial growers will only keep probably uh, three years um, 
uh, maybe five at the most because of, of viruses and, and that uh, uh, raspberries are very susceptible to a number of viruses and there's a, a number of diseases, uh, Phytophthora, that also causes a lot of problems. And so, um, so to have a, a real old planting, probably the disease buildup is just causing a lot of problems. I agree with that. And I look for, uh, usually they call it, get, they talk about crumbly berries. And that's usually the first sign of viruses are moving in. There's no cure for a virus. And so we just have to start a new planting. Um, what else we got here? Of course, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm showing my non-North Dakota roots. I don't know how to plant Cirrus, as in Cirrus River. Sorry about that. It was developed by the Morden Research Station uh -huh. so many years ago. It's an improved Boeing type, and uh -huh. Boeing is very, very widely uh, available Boeing. But um, maybe, well, maybe, maybe we got to do some research on this Cirrus yeah. type. Maybe it is superior. I figured it. Uh, maybe yeah, not because of the river. It had right. to be. Because right we there. didn't have any breeding, it had to be from Canada there. Right. How about does anybody else have any questions for Harleen? That's a pumpkin story. <laughs> okay, hearing none. Uh, well, thank you, Harleen, for your presentation. Thank you. Now we've got to start our raspberry patch now. I'm very excited about that. <laughs>